Hello, everyone, and um, thank you for joining us. On behalf of Univos US, my name is Jana Mergia. I'm president and CEO of the largest Latino civil rights and advocacy organization in the country. And I really want to welcome Congressman Cedric Richmond, senior advisor to the president and director of White House Office of Public Engagement. This is a huge role at the White House. And he's graciously given us some time today to really talk about some of the issues uh, that we've been working on together and that we know we're going to have to tackle even still as we look at, to the future. Congressman, uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, I really appreciate uh, your leadership, your voice, especially as it's related to uh, the Latino and immigrant communities. You and I have been in a lot of conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And <clears throat> President Biden is exactly who uh, he said he was on the campaign trail. And he's trying to meet the challenges that we have now, but also keep the promises he made on the campaign trail. And that is to govern with racial equity in mind. And we remind everybody that when we talk about racial equity, we mean black and brown in the immigrant communities all across this country and making sure that we're uh, fighting for everyone. And it's about empowerment. And uh, that's our focus. And we're trying to maintain as many relationships and get as much input from people as possible. So thank you for doing this for us because you allow us to reach uh, different audiences, bigger audiences. So thank you for that. Sure. Well, let me start with maybe the obvious. Uh, and I know, again, appreciate you, your team, and so many across the the White House and different agencies uh, working to engage and respond. But as you know, uh, the Latino community has been ex hit extremely hard uh, by the health and economic uh, consequences of the pandemic. Despite so many in our community being essential workers, 70% of Latinos serve in essential worker roles. And so many who pitched in and have stayed in it to keep the country going. You know, at Unidos US, we and our affiliates of community-based organizations across the country have been working hard since the pandemic uh, the, to make sure that as many Latinos as possible get access to relief and healthcare supports. And of course, this past year, our efforts have really centered on getting more Latinos vaccinated, uh, covered by health insurance. You know, we've been trying to sign folks up for the Affordable Care Act during this important period. But obviously, there's been hesitancy and other challenges, uh, including access to um, uh, SNAP, uh, food assistance programs, and helping make sure our community is more food secure, able to stay in their homes, uh, get back on track in the classrooms, and capable uh, ultimately of becoming re-engaged in the workforce. You know, what steps would you say that uh, President Biden and the administration uh, would highlight in particular as the best supports or relief efforts that you've seen. And again, I know you've seen Unidos US and our network very much at play in this. What, what would you say about that? Well, I would say I, one, our partnership is important, but two, I would highlight the fact that everything we're doing, we're doing with racial equity in mind in terms of making sure that when we first started, we saw the numbers from just pharmacies giving out the vaccines that they weren't high enough in black and brown communities. So then we engaged community health centers that are in uh, black and brown communities. And then we started to partner with organizations. And now we have uh, pharmacies who've agreed to extend the hours on Friday so that people who work later, people who work non-traditional jobs can have access. And we see a lot of that with frontline workers who are disproportionately black and brown. And then the other thing I would say is we are trying to amplify the message that uh, we want you vaccinated. It's free and uh, there's no requirement uh, for US citizenship there. And we wanna make sure that people understand that and that uh, we heard it a lot from our Latino groups that that was important. And so we're trying to amplify that. And then the other thing I would say in the American Rescue Plan, which was our 1.9, trillion dollar plan to provide relief to over you know 160 million households received uh, checks that we made sure that mixed status families could get 
uh, support from us and that they could get money because we know how hard it is right now. And that was different from previous administrations. But what we're trying to do in a nutshell is make sure that the resources get to the communities that need it most. Yeah, that's so important. And I really appreciate you mentioning the fact that we did have a breakthrough moment with, with the Biden administration uh, and with your help behind the scenes on access, uh, getting some of this important access uh, to mixed status families. That was the first time we've been able to see that happen. And we're hopeful that we can continue to build on that. You know, one key concern, and I'm really proud of the work that uh, Unidos U.S. Has, has led through our Esperanza Hope for All campaign because we understood how important uh, getting the vaccines into communities and with our community-based organizations, several of which are federally qualified in health centers, they have the trust of communities and that trust has been really important, right, to make sure that people are, 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 are engaged by people who are trusted partners. That's been really helpful in the area of vaccine hesitancy, although we still have a, lot, a little bit more work to do, but I've appreciated the, the racial equity lens that targeted these resources to communities of color. One area of concern that Latinos have, another related to that is, is the economic impact of, of the pandemic and, and their ability to stay in their homes through this crisis. Uh, we at Unidos US have over 50 organizations across the country working with families to provide housing counseling assistance because as you know, mm -hmm. families have been stretched. The American Rescue Plan Act included some key measures to help both renters and homeowners, uh, but we're finding that we're gonna need more federal support to, to ensure that these efforts prevent eviction and foreclosure, which would devastate so many uh, communities and families of color, including Latino families. How important is housing and home ownership to the, to the administration, would you say? And, and what ideas might be better um, under consideration to help address uh, some of the really serious housing challenges we're facing right now in the Latino and immigrant communities? Well, I'll just start with where you left off in housing. One of the first executive orders we did was to break down uh, systemic racism in terms of access to housing and home ownership where you pass down wealth to another generation and it's the best way to do it. So one of the things we did was to challenge our uh, housing and urban development secretary, Marsha Fudge, to look at redlining, uh, discriminatory appraisals based on the makeup of the neighborhood so that we can uh, tackle it very specifically in terms of home ownership and then when we talk about the pandemic assistance, we wanted to make sure that we put housing aid for renters and homeowners in that so that we can help with uh, back, utility, back utilities, rent and uh, mortgages. And, and that is important. And we're trying to get the word out there. And two other things I'll just mention that we were being intentional on uh, the American Rescue Plan and the things that we did in the American Rescue Plan will reduce poverty in the Latina community by 40% this year. It will reduce child poverty by 50% this year. And then on our Help Us Here tour, where we're going to make sure that people understand how to access the benefits, we're making sure that we do what we can do. And small things uh, that people view as small are really big deals. And so on Help Us Here, our one pager, we're doing in both English and Spanish so that people understand about the increase we did in the child tax credit from $3,000 to $3,600 and, and that you don't have to have a social security number, but that if you file uh, taxes or I-10, you will get that for your children. And then also what you've been doing with the Affordable Care Act, making sure that people sign up. And right now, the Affordable Care Act, there are more people signed up for it in the history of the Affordable Care Act, and that's because of organizations like you. And then what you started out with was the SNAP benefits because we know how important nutrition is. And so those are things that we're trying to do to make sure we're intentional about reaching everyone. Well, that intentionality matters so much because what we're finding is that a rising tide doesn't necessarily lift all boats. 
we've got to be intentional with that lens of equity. And I really have appreciated not only the words uh, by President Biden and Vice President Harris, but again, the efforts to execute with intention, trying to get those resources. I, I will say, look, the, the administration's goal to cut child poverty in half this year couldn't come at a better time. Yeah. But let me just ask you, uh, come back to that just real quick and just say the fact that we do have some barriers that prevent some in our community, especially children with immigrant parents, from accessing some of these important uh, safety net benefits and emergency assistance. And again, we're building on some work we've done to, to include mixed status families, but you know, are there any key steps you think the administration is taking right now to address some of these barriers for children and their families? And, and uh, maybe um, are there some specific areas either uh, separate from immigration reform or do that, does it have to be part of an overall reform of immigration for us to see that happen? I know the president was very vocal about the importance of, uh, of seeing some of those immigration uh, comprehensive reform efforts and saying from day one that he was going to push for that. Where are we with that? Well, number of answers to what you said. One of the things that we did on day one, which is important, is to make sure all of the data we get in government now, that it is desegregated and more finely so that we know the impact on very specific targeted areas. Look, the president really wants immigration reform. He sent a comprehensive immigration bill to Congress on day one. He still supports it. He's still moving to get it passed. Uh, but at the same time, he's not going to let his desire for a comprehensive bill get in the way of progress. And I think that that's why you see him support the Dream and Promise Act. That's why he supports the Farm Workforce Modernization Act because that steps in the right direction. And in his comprehensive bill, it created a pathway to citizenship for 11 million people. We thought that was critically important, but at the same time, uh, there are real champions in the Congress, like Senator Menendez, uh, Representative Sanchez, that are really fighting. And so we're gonna help do what they think is important and, and the path that they wanna take. But at the end of the day, Congress needs to pass comprehensive immigration reform. It's long overdue and it's the right thing to do. Let me ask you this, because there also was another bill introduced and I agree with you on the comprehensive, the uh, nature of, of the reforms that need to happen and the championing of Senator Menendez and Congresswoman Linda Sanchez. And you've referenced the, the other related bills, whether it's farm workers or dreamers, but one other approach that's emerged that could complement all of this is finding relief for those who played such a critical role as essential workers. And that's the bill that was introduced by Senator Alex Padilla, Elizabeth Warren, but also Joaquin Castro and Ted Lieu on the, on the, uh, on the House side. What, what, what prospects do we see for essential workers getting some relief in all of this right now? We're still in... And, and we want to see all of these things happen. We face a reality in terms of just a sheer math problem of how many votes are out there. Uh, but what we're doing is continuing to convene, whether it's members of Congress, both the House and the Senate, to talk about how important uh, this is. We think that um, we will continue uh, to do that. Uh, but as we said before, we think comprehensive is the way to go. But if we have to go at it in separate bills and make substantial real progress, that we're willing to uh, take that approach. And we're looking at what uh, Senator Padilla and, and uh, Representative Castro are putting out there along with the support of Senator Warren. So we're taking a very hard look at that also. Well, I sure have appreciated your engagement on this. Again, I know there's a lot going on, let me, let me ask you this. I know we, we start working closely together, uh, even in the transition. And I really appreciate, again, your reaching out because I know you understand how important having diverse representation in the administration is to all of us as communities of color. We launched our Proyecto 20% to make sure that we would be 
strong allies and working with the administration to appoint qualified people of color, including our Latino community. And y'all have uh, really uh, opened up opportunities for us to talk directly to different folks. And now we have a very diverse cabinet and that's to the credit of, of President Biden uh, following up. We're looking for other opportunities across agencies and the departments. Tell me how you feel that's going. I know, again, we're, we're engaging in a process still, but uh, talk to me a little bit about the president's commitment to diversity in his administration. Our commitment to diversity is real, and it comes straight from the top. The president has said his cabinet will look like this country, and so uh, we, we have a commitment to get there, and Janet, you all have pushed us and has demanded 20%. We're trying our best to reach that goal. Part of what we will say is what we said in the beginning as we were developing a cabinet, is sometimes it's kind of hard to look at announcements and rollout uh, as the total picture. Uh, and the best way to kind of pinpoint that is with uh, federal judges. Uh, there's a real commitment there, but based on which opening comes first and what senators make what recommendations, uh, you'll see the rollout, but there's a real commitment to make sure we have diversity on the bench and we have uh, Latino judges on the bench where we've never had them before. But more importantly, you started with what's the most important, and that is making sure that we have Latino persons in positions of power and real decision-making authority so that there's a voice at the table uh, for everyone. And the president is serious about that. And that is something that uh, we expect you to hold us accountable to. And we're going to keep doing our best. Well, seeing, seeing uh, our leaders, Javier Becerra, you know, Mayorkas, uh, we have Cardona and uh, Guzman in key agencies has been a real historic step for an administration to start with that many in terms of leaders in his cabinet. But uh, I know we're going to continue to to press for that representation across and on down. Uh, I'm wrapping up. I promise, uh, Congressman. Before I go though, I want to make sure two areas where we've worked closely in partnership, lockstep with the African American community, have been on policing reform and on voting reforms. And on policing reform, we just held a town hall with the NAACP and Derek Johnson. Uh, that included Karen Bass and Congress, uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass and Congressman Chewy Garcia, because we do want to see ultimately these uh, changes in such critically important areas that impact both Black and Latino uh, communities disproportionately. And of course, on the on the voter suppression front, we're very concerned about these laws at the state level that are emerging and are advocating for these federal changes. Uh, again, as we wrap up here, what can you tell us about any progress on both of those fronts and what you need uh, from us? Well, we need you to amplify the, the emergency that we're in in order to address both of those issues. Black and brown communities and the police that police them, there is a real disconnect and far too often it is a violent disconnect where black and brown people pay the ultimate price for that disconnect and then on voting, uh, these laws are coming up in a very targeted way uh, with like laser-like precision to keep black and brown communities from going to the voting polls. Democracy is important when everybody can express their desire for whoever has the best ideas, values, and morals. And it just so happens that that was Joe Biden this time. And what you don't do when an historic number of people in this country vote, you should celebrate that, not go enact laws to make it harder for people to vote. So I think that what we should be partnering to do is just educate people on the fact that we didn't have rampant voter fraud in this country. This is a solution in search of a problem. And this is designed for one thing and one thing only, and that is to make it harder for people to vote. But we're going to continue to fight. We, we look at the progress that's going on in Congress on both policing and voting. And you'll have HR 4 introduced uh, shortly when they finish building the record. HR1 is there. I think Senator Schumer is going to force a vote on it. We, we support it, but we need to amplify how important it is in minority communities that both of these things get resolved sooner rather than later. So last question, Congressman, 
you left the Congress. You were a member of Congress doing incredible work from the great state of Louisiana and the great city of New Orleans, the district there. And now you're in service to the president, one of the highest advisory roles that uh, I've witnessed as someone who formerly worked for a president and for President Clinton in the White House. What do you miss about being in Congress or what do you really enjoy about this role uh, that as we close, uh, you can kind of just give me some of your observations. Well, I miss some of my friends in, in Congress and the CBC, uh, which was family. And, but here, uh, you have a real ability to make a difference. And the reason why I left Congress is because I was, the president one asked me to, but he did it in a way uh, that was unique. He said that I knew from the two years on the campaign trail how serious he was about racial equity. And he said, I want you to come in the cabinet because I want you to remind others. I want you to make sure that everybody knows how serious I am, how we're gonna get this done. And we came through a campaign together. We wanna to govern together and I want you there to make sure that this is a transformational administration. And so uh, I could see how serious he was, so I did it. And so in that sense, uh, I really enjoy the ability to shape policy here, but at the same time, you kind of miss your friends from Congress. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, you're making new friends. We, we've been, I've enjoyed personally having a chance to work with you and your engagement, not just you know uh, across the board and a real interest and sincere desire to make sure that the Latino community and immigrant communities are included at every step. It's personally been very, very uh, uh, inspiring for me to see that. And I look forward to working with you and, and your team. And of course, with the Biden administration, I know sometimes, like you said, I push a little bit harder and we want you all to be accountable to what you've said in terms of the campaign. But but I really appreciate the open door and your openness to hearing every aspect and to learning even more about the Latino and immigrant communities. But thank you, Congressman, for your leadership and particularly in this role and uh, running uh, not only the Office of Public Engagement, but being an advisor to President Biden. We can welcome the chance to continue to stay connected and uh, thanks for your time today. Well, we value your partnership, but more importantly, and just as importantly, we value your input and we'll continue to work together and we have a lot of work to do, uh, but together we can get it done. Amen. Thank you, Thank you Congressman. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you.